classroom site. So I'm okay, so let's do this before we get into my notes. Um, somebody share with me what was discussed in your guys' uh, breakout rooms. So a couple of questions are on the table. Um, one being, what's the thesis? What's the main point of the reading? Um, what does the text say about the society that produced it? What is your favorite text? And then um, what's your favorite attribute or characteristic about yourself that was discussed amongst your, your breakout groups for 10 minutes? So now share with me what was shared in the breakout groups. Well, we discussed um, whether or not this was sort of commandments or was it uh, just his experience uh, being 110 years, years old. Was that his approximate age? Correct. So, you know, he's seen it all. Um, so, so he could, you know, you could go either way. Whatever he says could be taken as truth anyway, because anyone that's 110, uh, you know, doesn't have any time to BS. So uh, we're just talking about building trust, uh, how society, that society was sort of um, based on trust, trustworthiness, um, being humble, being generous, um, building character, and then building a legacy based on your behaviors rather than your wealth. Yeah, I think that's a um, it's a great encapsulation of the text, Jelani. Thank you for that. Um, and, and really, I think how you ended it was spot on, right? Your legacy being built off of your actions opposed to your wealth. And we exist in a society that is the complete inverse, right? Like, you're going to be recognized in our society more so by the wealth that you left behind. Who cares? Who gives a fuck about what you did, right? As long as you got that wealth, then you could become somebody of importance. So vastly different the way that they saw things of importance juxtaposed to how we see things of importance in our contemporary society. Um, other thoughts, comments, concerns about the reading or the discussion that you guys had within the breakout rooms? Actually, let somebody tell me, what do you think your best or your favorite characteristic or attribute is? Who talked about that? I'm curious to know. You didn't have to read it to know this answer. Just have to know yourself, be a little reflective. Madeline, what is your, what do you feel your greatest characteristic or attribute is? Um, I would say being creative and just open to everything. Okay. Creativity and openness. I like that. Um, Vanessa, what would you say is your greatest attribute or characteristic? Um, my greatest attribute would probably be, I'm not sure. I feel like I can't really determine that myself. <laughs> okay. Um, for those who don't know, your task, your homework assignment will be to figure out. Um, in about three weeks or so, we'll have a reading, and this is going to come up again, and I I'm going to want to know your answer. Um, Vanessa, I'm going to for sure call on you when that time comes. So, so put down some thoughts as to what you think that is. Um, for anyone else who may not know what their greatest strength or attribute may be, Put some thought into it. That's your homework assignment. I will revisit this conversation in a couple of weeks. Um, give somebody else one more before we go. Um, thoughts on your conversation in the breakout room? Ashlyn, what was discussed in your guys' breakout room? Um, we talked a little bit about our favorite attributes about ourselves. So I guess like if I were to answer that question, it would be that I like listening to what people have to say. So I try my best to understand their perspective. And so Ashlyn, how would you pertain that particular attribute 
to what was discussed in the reading? Um, I think in the reading, they talk a lot about trying to be the bigger person. So like if there's someone that it's like if you got into a dispute with a poor man, it's better to not attack them. So then it would be because you have to understand where they're coming from, possibly, and other people respect will respect you for that. And, and I think also to, to add on to that, right, a listen, listening becomes a core component within this text on how to be a good person, right? It's fundamental that you become a good listener. In fact, when the book talks about sons being good sons, the fundamental thing that they have to do is listen to the words of their father, right? So I, I, I find it interesting that this is the second class that someone said their greatest ish attribute is to listen. And to me, that's in direct alignment with what we read throughout the text. Um, so what we'll do is I'm gonna give you guys my notes about the reading. Um, from there, we'll transition into our fishbowl. Um, what I'll ask to happen at the time of the fishbowl, if this is your first time in class, I'm gonna ask you to put your hand up on the screen so I know not to call on you, okay? But for now, just listen to my notes and then we'll move that into our, our, our fishbowl conversation. Uh, if you're putting your hand up now because of the fishbowl statement, don't, you can put it down now. I'm gonna go through my notes first. So I'll let you know when I'm gonna ask you for those hands up. I just wanna kind of give you the heads up. Um, Alejandro, do you have a question or were you raising your hand because of the, okay. So my notes, right? So this is the teachings of Patahotep. This book is also titled The Oldest Book in the World. And within the text, they're going to give you some validity to that statement. Um, FYI, for those who are uh, um, going to pursue a life of scholarship, right? If you're reading a book, don't just start at chapter one. Read the preface, read the foreword read the introduction. All of that information within those parts of the book are very generative and very important, right? Um, so a lot of what I'll be discussing will be from the book's pre uh, preface. Um, you guys didn't have access to that, so don't, don't worry about it, but I just wanna let you guys know as scholars, you need to be reading these type of materials also. So to Jelani's point, um, Patahotep was 110 years old when he produced this text, right? So Again, this situates a few things. The way that the comedic society looked at elders and they held them up on the pedestal. And the reason why elders are held up on the pedestal is to Jelani's point, they seen a lot, right? And when you see a lot, you know a lot, right? Um, during the time of Patah writing, Patahotep completing this text, he had two options, right? He was in line to become the Pharaoh of Kemet but he neglected the throne and chose to take the life of a priest. So he, he opted for the priesthood opposed to being a pharaoh. Now this is very fecund as it pertains to insight to the Kemetic mystery school. So how the Kemetics ran their educational systems, right? There was two avenues that would be, that would be produced if you went through the Kemetic mystery schools. One would be politics, so becoming a pharaoh, etc. The other would be more spiritual becoming a priest, becoming a sage. Patahotep chose the spiritual route, okay? Um, so the Medur Netur, right? The Medur Netur, also known as what they call, or what you guys may call the hieroglyphics, okay? So when the Greeks and the Romans came into what you guys know as Egypt, which originally was called as Kemet, and they seen the architecture and the writings that was inscripted into the walls, they called it the hieroglyphics. The Kemetics themselves referred to it as the Meter Niter, right? And that is spelled M as in Mary, D as in David, W as in Walter, Niter, N as in Nancy, E as in Edward, T as in Tom, C-H-E-R, Meter Niter, right? So this is not only Africa's, but it's the world's oldest recorded writing system. Okay, this is the oldest recording writing system in the world. Now, what becomes important is there is no evidence of a developmental period. There is no recorded evidence of a developmental period. What is that saying? It's simply stating that when they were researching and they located this written dialect, 
they could not find any evidence of a point of it being developed, right? So when they came across this written dialect and metronature, it was already fully developed. It was in a stage of completion, right? Um, the, the instructions of Patahotep, they were copied during the Middle Kingdom, right? The fifth dynastic age. But with further research, you could say approximately that this was developed 2,500 years before Christ, right? So if you wanted to approximate this text, you could say 2,500 years before the birth of Christ, Patahotep penned this text, which makes it, in effect, the oldest text in the world, okay? So what... Patahotep sought to do was to develop the Metur Nefer, right? The Metur Nefer, which means good speech. Metur Nefer is spelled M D W Nefer, N F R, right? Good speech. Now, this course is the African oral tradition. What we just traced and located is the origins, the erratic point. Right, the radix point, the starting point of the African oral tradition. And it's concerned with good speech, right? So when I speak to you, I speak words that build you up, that speak truth to you, that speak power to you, right? That speaks to you in a way that is loving, right? Now, if you've been in this class for any amount of time, you know I have no problem with profanity, right? But I understand that they call them curse words. Right? I don't look at it like that, but I understand the intentionality behind that. This idea that your words can curse someone, right? That your words can call harm or ill will to be placed on that individual's being, right? The ancient comedics, the ancient Africans understood this, this concept profoundly. And this is why Patahotep was concerned with cultivating a system that develops meter nefer, good speech, right? So that way the society could exist in harmony with one another, right? And he says in the text, let me get to the passage. Um, one second, y'all. Okay, so I'm looking at page 16, bottom of the page. I'm going to just read the whole, the whole passage for you. May your servant, this is Patahotep speaking to his, to his superior, right? May your servant be authorized to use the status that old age affords, right? That status that old age affords is wisdom. So let me use my wisdom to teach the hearers so as to tell them the words of those who have listened to the ways of our ancestors and of those who have listened to the gods. May I do this for you, his superior, right? So that strife may be banned from among our people. What does strife mean? What does strife mean? Not rhetorical, it's a question. What does strife mean? Pain and hardship. Right, absolutely. So what he's saying is, let me teach this society about matter and the fur. So that way there is no strife, there's no beefs, there's no rifts, there's no issues, there's no problems amongst your society so that your society can exist within harmony, right? Um, so I do this for you so that strife may be banned from among our people and so that the two shores may serve you, right? So this is the desire of Patahotep as he goes to write this passage. What I become very attentive to is how much speech is used throughout the text and how much hearer is used throughout the text. I'm going to read that passage one more time and pay attention to how many times that he uses speech or hearing, right? May your servant be authorized to use the status that old age affords to teach the hearers so as to tell them the words of those who have listened to the ways of our ancestors and those who have listened to the gods, right? So it's all about hearing and it's all about speaking. So when I asked Ashlyn, how does that relate to the text? It's a direct correlation to the text. 
Because who Hotep is writing to is the hearers of God's words, to the hearers of the words of the ancestors. You cannot hear without something being uttered to you, right? So this gets to the core fundamentals of what the African oral tradition is about. It's about this idea, about this notion of relation. Um, I believe in week eight or so, we'll read a text called The Poetics of Relation by Edward Glissant. And this notion of relation is about how do we react and interact with one another, right? It's the root word to relationship, relation, right? So when I speak to you, do I speak to you in a way that makes you feel good or do I tear you down? When I greet you, do I greet you in a way that makes you feel empowered or do I make you feel less than yourself, right? These are these ideas of relation. And this is what not only Patahotep, but comedic society is concerned with. It's establishing a society that's based on positive relations. Okay, so those are my notes. Is there any questions about what I mentioned so far? All right, so at this point, if this is your first time in class, I'm gonna ask you to put your hand up on the screen so I know not to call on you. Okay, so now that that's been established, um, is, there, is there anybody who wants to volunteer for the fishbowl? You have two to do the semester, so if you go today, you only have one left. Um, if you want to volunteer, just shout out your name. Don't raise your hand because I don't want to confuse myself with those who have not who are, have not been in class before. So uh, we'll do it this way: um, Arturo, Jelani, Jasmine, um, Nathaniel, Ashlyn, and who is this at the bottom? Um, Jasmine, so I'm gonna just put your hand up for you. I know that you have not. Um, it's your first time in class, so I know not to call on you. Okay. Um, so that would be Kevin. So all I, so to Fishbowl, we'll take three people. Um, it would be Arturo, either either Arturo, Jelani, Nathaniel, Ashlyn, or Kevin. Those are the people who are able to Fishbowl today. We'll only go with two, just because we have so small numbers. Is there anyone who wants to volunteer? All right. So what we'll go is Ashlyn. Are you prepared to Fishbowl today? Um, yeah, could we just go over like what we do, what our role is again one more time? Yep, it's simple. Um, all you're going to do is you can either read literally from your journal. That's perfectly fine. Uh, you could talk about what was discussed in your breakout groups, or you could just mention anything that you found of importance for the reading, something that you liked, something that you didn't like, something that you were confused about. It doesn't matter. You could even um, talk about what I mentioned in the, um, in my brief um, description of my notes. It's totally up to you. Um, just mention something about the reading to kind of kick off class conversation. Okay, that makes sense. Okay. Cool. Um, Arturo, are you prepared to fishbowl today? Yeah, I'll go. Okay, Arturo. Let's see if we get one more. Uh, Kevin, are you prepared to fishbowl today? Yeah, I'm down. Okay, so our fishbowl today will be Ashlyn, Arturo, and Kevin. Again, you do not have to do anything too deep. You can either read literally from your journal, uh, you could re-articulate what was discussed in your breakout rooms, or you could talk about what was mentioned in my brief notes, or anything that stood out to you for, for the reading. I'm gonna put myself on mute, and whoever wants to start, kick us off. So Ashley and Arturo or Kevin, we got, when y'all gotta say something, let's go. Uh, okay, um, so one of the things that I found interesting that related back to the lecture from last week was when they were talking about women. So we learned that unlike white European culture, there existed a high level of respect for women. I think there was a part in the passage, it was like line 20, it was like rule 21 about filling her belly and clothing her, caressing her, um, fulfilling her wishes and things like that. And then I also noticed that it talked about how women were fertile fields for their husband. So that also puts an emph emphasis on family connection and family structure specifically within that society. 
And I thought that there's no denying how important women are in African society, but I did also notice that the text seemed to be directed towards men because it addresses using words like he, him, rather than using female pronouns. So I feel like even though they still highly respect women, there's still that idea where of male significance in society. Good point. Um, I'm gonna let the, let's go through the fishbowl, but I'm definitely gonna circle back to that point, Ashton. I'm, I'm glad you raised that. Um, who's next? Arturo or Kevin? Yeah, I'll go next. So what I got from the reading is that I see this as, um, I would um, kind of correlate these rules as to like something that has been passed on from generation to generation. As we had talked about in the last lecture where um, we said Africans were the first humans and they had made like all basically everything first. And I see that this like type of prophecy that they made rules has been shipped out to like many regions of the world. And like, for example, me being Mexican, we call them consejos, rules. And every region of the world has like different, like um, they have similar rules, but they may alter it in a different way. And like, for example, like uh, treating your elders with respect and having to be like the man of the house or giving advice to the children. And I see that moving on from generation to generation, we see a little bit of a difference or an alteration to it. Although it may be the same, they just don't, we don't view it as the same anymore. It's just a bit different. And it provides, this reading provided me with um, a bit more of intel of what or how it started all. And I see it as, a better way of viewing how it all happened. Mm. Okay. This gives you more of a historical context of, of like religious origins. Okay. That makes sense. Thank you, Arturo. Uh, Kevin, you want to close this out? Oh, uh, yeah. Similar to Arturo, I sort of got the same thing. Uh, basically, what I got from the test is that wisdom is something that you gain through old age. So that's why the elderly are held like on a pillar. Um, and well, similar to what he said, the thing that I like from the end of the text is that if advice is given for the good, the great will speak accordingly. So basically you leave, you pass on your, your advice to the next generation and build society from there. Yeah, thank you, Kevin. Um, real quick before I get into um, my response to Ashlyn's comments about the role of women. Um, for those who fishbowled, how did y'all feel about the fishbowl process? I feel it as like a discussion between like us and then giving like our intel on what we read and, you know, just giving a discussion of like overall aspect of the reading and then giving out um, the, the viewpoints of each of us. Yeah. Do you, did you feel like it was hard or something difficult? No, I just I just feel like it's a uh, it's like if we were in a breakout room, but you know, just the entire classroom overall, yeah. Yeah. So, I, I just I asked that question for those who were a little apprehensive or nervous about the fishbowl. It ain't shit, right? Like you're just gonna come up and talk about what you feel was important. Arturo, you're absolutely right. What you talk about in the fish, I'm sorry, in the breakout rooms could be literally what you talk about in the fishbowl. Like I, I'm okay with that. Um, in fact, I do the journals and I do the breakout rooms in the order that I do them. So you have something to talk about in the fishbowl. So I'm literally setting you guys up for success. So it's no reason to be apprehensive, scared, or feel like you're unprepared for it. You're just talking about some shit that you already talked about, right? It's, it's really not that big of a deal. Um, but it's going to require you to talk. In fact, this whole class is dependent on y'all talking. Um, I'm going to let y'all in behind the curtains. This is my third class, right? I have a class at 1055. I have a class at 140. And um, I have a class at 12, that little window in between at 12, right? So I'm talking about this shit. This is my third time talking about this. I should not have more energy talking about this than y'all should, right? I'm going to need y'all to give me, which I'm giving to you. I'm going to need more energy. I shouldn't have to pull teeth. I, I feel like I'm in K through 12 trying to get y'all to talk. Y'all adults. You read the material, talk about the material, right? I understand that this is not easy material. This is on purpose. This is to challenge your intellectual curiosity, 
right? For those who are, have not been here before, the material that you'll be reading is literally from a PhD level program. I'm in a PhD program at Claremont Graduate University. I'm pulling the readings from that program and I'm having you guys engage these readings. Now, what you read about Tahoe Tep, that's not from Claremont. They are not talking about that type of shit at Claremont Graduate. Don't think that they're advanced. This is from my personal library. But the point remains, right? This is gonna be dense material. I want you to struggle with it. And the great way to struggle with material is to dialogue the material, okay? Um, Ashlyn, what the passage that you talked about, um, what, what, what number was that again? Could you tell me where it says the woman's um, belly is a fertile ground? Um, it's talking about how to... Mm. Do you remember what number that was? I it, was it was page six on the first reading, on part one of the reading, and it was number 21. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to read the whole passage. Um, I'm going to kind of break this down because I thought you were going to go in a different direction with that statement, Ashlyn, but I, I do want to address it and I want to read it so the whole class could be familiar with what we're talking about. So it says, when you prosper and establish your home, love your wife with a door. So like adore your wife, right? Then fill her belly and clothe her back. Caress her. Give her ornaments to soothe her body. Fulfill her wishes for as long as you live. She is a fertile field for her husband. Do not be brutal. Good manners will influence her better than force. Do not contend with her in courts. Keep her from the need to resort to outside powers. Her eye is her storm when she gazes. It is by such treatment that she will be compelled to stay in your house. <laughs> so when I was reading this, I was like, man, this is kind of, um, I initially interpreted this as very subjective to women, right? do this so she can stay in your home, right? She's a fertile grounds for your husband, right? So it's almost, if not read carefully, you could almost interpret this as the women's role is to be subservient to the husband, to bear children, etc. But that's not what they're saying. Especially when you get to the latter portion of the, of the passage, it's really talking about the agency of women, right? So if you're not doing what these things are saying, it's within her right to go find another motherfucker who's going to do what you're not doing, right? If you want to keep her in your house, you better do these things. If not, she's within her full right to leave your ass, right? Don't be brutal, right? Manners gets a lot more done than brutality, right? But to me, this is where it gets really fecund. Her eye is her storm when she gazes, right? And to me, that really talks about the agency and the power of women, right? If your woman is gazing at you, you about to feel that storm, right? And what Patahotep is trying to do is try to instruct you to avoid that storm, right? Even for her to be fertile, right? A fertile field. Initially, I just thought of that as, as reproduction, right? But I think it's a lot more deeper than that. And, 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 and even for me, and I think about my relationship, Yes, my, my wife has produced babies for me, right? That's something that happens. But there's so many other things that my wife has done for me that go outside of just the realm of me having children, right? She's made my life so much more fertile in so many other areas, right? That go outside of just her being the mother to my children. Uh, you wanna say something, Jelani? Just that you're on point. That, that's just total agreement, sorry. Yes. Yeah. No, it's all good. Um, but see, to me, that's the benefit of, of you having a camera on, bro. I could see something was moving and it allowed me to give you the time to um, address that. But again, my, my point is to bring up, right, there is an agency that they allow the women to have within this text. I, I think that's even said backwards. There's an agency that women occupy that is referenced within this text. That's the, really what I should have said. Um, and to Ashton's second point, right, he, you're absolutely right. Throughout the 30, well, the 37, I'll call them Proverbs, it's always framed within a male characteristic. But towards the end of the text, he starts to use both. He'll start to use him and her. I'm trying to find a, um, a passage where he does that. Yeah, I noticed that too. Yeah, yeah. So I don't necessarily have a response, but to me, that's a question that I would have that would produce further research, right? So what is the distinction for Batahotep where he's strictly using male pronouns 
to where towards the later half of the passage where he's using both him and her him and her right where is the distinction why is there a difference right and i and i bring that up as an example of questions that could promote further research right that's that when we talk about the fourth component of your journal the questions there's three type of questions one i don't really understand this so i'm asking the question to get understanding right that's one way of thinking about a question two i have a question that's gonna produce me to do deeper research, right? That may produce a paper, that may produce a dissertation, right? May produce a documentary. And I think what I just posed is a great example of that. So why is it that Patahotep is using strictly male pronouns at the beginning of the text, then he shifts to using both towards the end? Why did he do that? And then from that question, I'm gonna go try to answer that question, which will produce more research, right? And then the final one is a question for critique, right? So the United States telling of history says that Columbus discovered the Americas. Well, I find that interesting because I know that there were people here on American soil prior to Columbus being here. So how could Columbus find or discover America when people were already here, right? So that's a question being posed, but I'm critiquing this idea that Columbus is the founder of America, right? So those are three type of questions that you could ask. By the end of the semester, I want you guys to start situating yourself within the last two type of questions. That's good intellectual work, right? Questions that could produce research and questions that produce critique. I want to move you guys from questions because I don't understand to those latter two type of questions, right? So for those who is your first time in the course, that's the fishbowl. Um, for those who have not been here before, now that you've seen the fishbowl, how do you feel about the fishbowl? I believe it's an interesting activity to like understand what other people are interpreting, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. And you know, Jasmine, that's a good point because that's another unintended um, purpose of the fishbowl is to get you guys to learn from each other, right? I'm not the authority of knowledge in this course. I'm, I'm, I'm designing the course so that way I can learn just as much as y'all from y'all that you learn from me. Right. I learned some shit listening to y'all in the fishbowl. That's why it's set up that way. Just like it's designed for you guys to learn from each other. That's why you have the breakout room. So that way you can learn from each other. Right. This is all designed to have an exchange um, to, to flip this notion of the banking ideal of education on its head. All right. So now that we've completed our fishbowl, um, congratulations, you guys did a, a great job. So uh, hats off to all three of you who went. Um, we're going to just open it up to class conversation. Um, anyone could engage whatever was discussed so far. If there's questions, whatever, we're just going to open it up now for class conversation. And it does not mean me talking and y'all listening. That means y'all talking amongst each other. And I'll chime in from time to time. Another thing. So I know I've heard a lot of comparisons um, of this to the Bible, to religious texts and things of that nature. Um, what do y'all think about the reality that this was written 2,500 years before the birth of Christ? What does that make you think? Talk to me about that. And for those who have not read it, from what you've heard so far, right? What does it mean to you that this was written 2,500 years before Christ even walked the planet. Well, I, I know I mentioned before that, you know, the Egyptians are seen as the ancients of the ancients. So, you know, a lot of this is the, uh, you know, the, the center of religious knowledge for the world that, you know, spread out as, as Bibles, you know, Quran, even, you know, all the stories spread from Kemet. And you can see at the core of Kemetic knowledge is just, you know, basic human behavior, just, you know, nothing too abstract, you know, just humility and, and you know, restraining judgment, which is all themes in the Bible and, and most religious texts anyway. But this, this is the core of it. This is where it all started. Yeah. Yeah. Great, great point, July. This is the foundation, right? Like, um, who, who knows the acronym of the Bible? Or who knows that the Bible is actually an acronym, right? And if you do know that the Bible is an acronym, what does the acronym mean? So 
So the acronym for the Bible is Basic Instructions Before Leaving Earth. Basic Instructions Before Leaving Earth, right? And if we think about the lecture that we um, had last week, and if you think about the video that we watched for that lecture, and um, uh, Ashwa Kwesi is talking about how the pyramids aligned with the stars, which aligned with Orion's belt, right? And this notion of creating heaven on earth, right, on earth as it is in heaven, which is in the, uh, I think it's called the Lord's Prayer, is what they, that, 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 that's derived from also. This idea, though, of creating heaven on earth, right? The Bible is an acronym for the basic instructions before leaving earth. And a lot of you guys ask, I don't know if these are instructions, I don't know if these are commandments, right, how to classify this. What these are, are principles, right? life principles and to me where you can draw the distinction between the bible it's not about what to do to make it into the afterlife right it's not about do these things follow these commandments and then you go to heaven right it's about do these things so you could have heaven here on earth right so you don't have to have strife within your society right how much strife is in our world today Right? We have political strife, we have racial strife, we have economic strife, we have healthcare strife. Anything that you can think of, we can locate some kind of strife within that, right? This is how our society operates. We just got insight into a society that is designed not to have any strife. Off the simple principle of how you communicate with one another. That is so profoundly simplistic, it's brilliant. They got rid of all the other shit and just got to the core. It's all about how we treat one another. That's it. That's it. And that starts with how you speak to somebody. Simple as that. It's so brilliant and simple. So then I asked the question in the breakout groups, what does this say about the society that produced it? Right? What does this say about the ancient comedic society that they are only concerned with how one another treats one another? They're only concerned with eliminating strife from their society. Right? What must it be like to live in that world where there ain't nobody arguing or bickering? Right? Um, Here's another one. I'm gonna read um, passage 11. And think about this in juxtaposition to how our world operates. Follow your heart as long as you live. Do no more than is required. I'm gonna read that one more time. Do no more than is required. Do not shorten the time of follow the heart since that offends the cop. Don't waste time on daily cares over and beyond providing for your household. Don't waste time on daily care over and beyond providing for your household. When wealth finally comes, then follow your heart. Wealth does no good if you are glum. Hmm. Let me ask y'all, why are you going to school? Why are you going to get your bachelor's? Why are you thinking about going to get a master's? Why are you doing that? It's not an esoteric or deep question. Why are you going to school? What, what is your end goal when you get out of school? What do you want to do? For what? What do you want to use this and transition it to? Um, can I go, mister? Yeah, yeah, please. Um, well, for me, honestly, I'm going to school for to get a a degree in psychology, meaning um, educating myself, meaning preparing myself of how to be able to, in order to be successful throughout the whole entire life and being able to help one another and help how other people try to speak for themselves and listen to what other people are talking Okay. Um, do you want to get an occupation in the... Um psychiatry field in the field of psychiatry yes yeah okay mm -hmm. um vanessa you said you're going to become a physician um so that's an occupation 
Miguel, what are you going to school for? Um, I myself also want to become a physician for the reason of, um, what do you call it? Uh, bettering my economic situation. I, uh, I don't have the best economic situation, but I also don't have the worst. But uh, over time, it's it's begun to change. That it's not just because of money; it's to to um to help my future, my my future kids, grandkids. And if I can start by getting a higher education, getting money, I can set them off to a better path in their future. Okay. Um, and then Ashley put in the chat; she wants to become a, a nurse practitioner. So, like. Let's put all the lofty shit aside, right? Like, Destiny, I feel you. You said all the, the, the beautiful, artistic, poetic shit that you could think of. I, I heard you. You was trying to pull. I got you. But at the end of the day, y'all going to job for fucking money, man. Stop playing. Y'all all, Miguel said it. I'm trying to improve my economic situation. Point blank, period. There's nothing wrong with that. But ain't none of y'all going to school to follow your heart, Right? What would you go to school for if you're going to school to follow your heart? What would your educational experience look and feel like if you're going to follow your heart? What would your work experience look and feel like if you were working based off of what your heart desired? Because destiny, which you were talking about, you could do those things without being a psychiatrist, straight up. There's ways that you, you can start a nonprofit and do that. Um, I believe Jasmine put in the chat that she wanted to be, I don't know if it was Jasmine or Vanessa said they want to be a, a physician. You could do the things that physicians do as far as servicing people without going to school, but you probably won't get that pay, right? So again, I bring this up to have you understand the distinction between the way that our society operates. We do everything. We do everything because of this. Even we don't even know it, we do it because of that, right? How many of y'all thought about what your heart desires? How many of y'all even know what your heart desire is. That's one of the reasons why I asked you, what do you think your best attributes and characteristics are? Because they're probably similar and it's probably situated with one another. But we've been so trained and socialized and conditioned not to even pay attention to those type of things that really matter. We've been trained, conditioned, and socialized to go get that paper. And you wonder why we have a society that is dependent on strife. We even watch strife as entertainment. First thing you do is pick up and see what, what beef is going on or what bullshit is going on and that don't even pertain to your life, right? We've been conditioned to take that as entertainment. Y'all don't hear me, man. Y'all ain't y'all ain't y'all ain't feeling me. I'm just talking. I think uh black black thought no uh, quest love called it pain porn. Pain porn. Yep. And so if you get into entertainment, especially movies, especially what they call black cinema, that's all it is. It's pain porn. How many times do I need to see 12 Years a Slave? I know that shit happened. I know. I don't need to see another movie of that. We have 12 Years a Slave. We have Roots. We have uh, fucking Birth of a Nation. Uh, the, not the original, the other one. We, I could go on and on and on and on and on and on and on. How many movies have y'all seen about the slaves killing a slave master? I ain't seen that one. You got that little bullshit Django, but I mean like a real movie that kind of goes into that. We don't get that. Yeah, I, I, I saw I talked about Ashton and Django, but uh, that's farce to me. Django is a parody, right? But you get my point. What else? Also, one I do with also want to add to um, say how other people just look on social media. Also, like the like the TV news, how they be talking about po politics and about how you know how the Black Lives Matter and we still on today. Still, they're not even fixing the situation. And us humans that we have a voice to speak on, like it matters to still on today. Like no matter what. But look on social media just because, oh, there's like a lot of like importance or a lot of like events um, or politics going around like today in society. Like that really, really doesn't really matter. The point is, is that 
we all need to speak up for what we we need to for everyone to hear and to hear our voices. So I just wanted to add on to that. Yeah, absolutely. And then I would say to even take it further, right? We all need to kind of take some time within ourselves to find out what our heart desire is. Like, how how can you truly be happy if you don't know what makes you happy? So what you're doing is you're just doing what you're told that provides happiness. We're all following this um, matrix that's been laid before us that you go to school, you get your degree, you get your job, you get your family, and then you'll be happy. Like it says, everyone follows that same matrix. Who's to say that that's how it has to work? And it's funny that the majority of the people who we deem to be successful in this society, them motherfuckers didn't go to school. Bezos, Elon Musk, uh, what's his name from Facebook? Zuckerberg. All them dropped out of school, but they'll tell you, hey, get that degree, get that education, right? What is it really? I'll tell you to, one, find out what your heart desire is. Two, once you find that out, go pursue that. And it even says in the text, when wealth finally comes, then what do you do? Follow your heart. Because it says it'll come. Follow your heart anyway. All right. So let me show you guys where um, to locate the readings for next week. Um, again, by Thursday, I'll email out these readings for you next week. Um, for those who have just your first time in class, this will be the flow of the class every week. We'll have the breakout rooms. We'll have my, um, the conversation about the breakout rooms, my notes, fishbowl, class conversation, okay? Um, bear with me one second. If you have not had a chance to access the Google Classroom, please do. Um, if you don't have the link to the Google Classroom, email me. Um, I'll give that to you, but before you do so, if you have a syllabus, the link to the Google Classroom is on your syllabus. So you can do that before you email me. Um, but this is what the Google Classroom looks like. Um, stream will be all of the, uh, like the notes and announcements. Um, I'm gonna put an announcement saying how the course is divided up between group A and group B. That'll be up by the end of the day. Um, course classwork is probably the more important tab. Um, we're on weeks one through three still. We just finished um, the teachings of Patahotep. So our next reading will be Karanga Ma'at. One, two, three. Read all three of them, but think of it as one reading. So you only do one journal entry, but read all three texts. Um, this is some additional reading, extra reading. If you want to go that route, you don't have to, but you do need to read Karanga, Maulana Karanga, the Department of Pan African or Department of Africana Studies at Cal State Long Beach. He's the chair of that department, and he's also um, the creator of Kwanzaa. Um, Maulana Karanga uh, wrote this. Again, one, two, and three. Read all three and make one journal entry about that. Um, the journals will be submitted two times. Once will be submitted at your midterm. The second time will be submitted during the final. Okay, so that's the only times that you have to worry about getting those journals to me. Um, here is the recorded course lectures. So if you did not attend last week's lecture, this up and available to you. Um, by the end of tomorrow, today's lecture will be made available also. So under the course lecture section, you'll be able to access these uh, recordings. Is there any last minute questions, comments?